Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is day one of this seven-day sashin in July, spanning into August 2014 here at Hidden Valley Zen Center. And I'd like to share with you a a classic in Zen. It's called the Ten Ox Herding Pictures. In Song Dynasty China, uh, which is a, a time of great connection between Chinese Buddhism and, and Japanese Zen Buddhism, with a lot of monks and masters going back and forth, uh, was a very, very ripe time for Buddhist practice in both countries. And uh, a gentleman, one, one master, de developed some pictures of the uh, purported um, path to awakening in Zen called the Ten Oxerty Pictures. They were one uh, beginning with searching for the ox. The ox, of course, uh, standing in for uh, our true mind, representing our true mind. And ending with, in that case, with, with enlightenment. And, uh, and then some years later, but still in the Song Dynasty, uh, another Chinese master did a further interpretation of these 10 Oxfording pictures. And instead of ending with enlightenment, it continues to a point where the, the person who has gone through this uh, entire project of coming to awakening and then also integrating that awakening with her or his uh, being uh, has is the final picture as going into the marketplace with this bestowing hands. In, in other words, becoming totally normal going into society and working for the liberation of all beings, not as somebody who is working for the liberation of all beings, but as a, an enlightened person who is simply embodying that enlightened activity. And it plays out in whatever is the karmic uh, path of the person that it's playing out from. And this set of 10 pictures has carried down to the present day because it's it's a very um, very clear uh, indication of the path to awakening and beyond the path of complete Zen practice for for anyone Western Eastern it doesn't matter it's just as relevant to modern day America as it was to Song Dynasty China or to uh, Japan of that era or Japan of today. I'll be sharing uh, some of the, the original writings of this set of 10 Oxfording pictures in a book called Lectures on the 10 Oxfording Pictures, 
by Yamada Mumon Roshi, and these are translated by Victor Sogen Hori. Uh, Gensan, as we know him, uh, is a bilingual Japanese-Canadian monk professor. He spent, I think, 13 years at a Rinzai monastery in Japan, training deeply. Uh, and during that time, had uh, Kensho experience, presumably experiences, because uh, stopping at one is, is to sit down on the path and, and quit in a certain way. Uh, and uh, in the Rinzai way of working in practice, we work with koans, those puzzling conundrums that are taken from public cases of, of history Encounters between masters and monks, or monks and monks, or uh, various other various other demonstrations of the search for true nature and an expression of true nature. And in the Rinzai sect, these are often uh, done along with what's called capping phrases in English, uh, the Zenrin Kushu is a collection, one of many collections, one, one of many similar collections of capping phrases. These are fractions of Chinese poetry, classical Chinese poetry, uh, expressions that may have been uttered by a master or a monk uh, in ancient times in response to something important. And uh, when a student has worked through a koan, uh, in the series that includes working as well with the, these uh, capping phrases, uh, then, then the teacher asks the student to bring in a go, as it's called, uh, one of these capping phrases. And we search through this very thick book, uh, and thankfully, Ginsam Sogenori has translated it into English after a great deal of research and uh, some very, very helpful translation along with uh, Thomas Ewell Kirshner, who's, who's a real fine translator, as well as the Zen monk is in, in Japan now. And, and that book is called Zen Sand. So Genzan has, has quite a couple of uh, very important translations under his belt that have made it much, much, much easier for Westerners to to do Rinzai Zen. Yamada Mumon Roshi was a Rinzai master in the lineage of Hakuin, and all the Rinzai lineages nowadays go through Hakuin because Hakuin was able to uh, resurrect and reinvigorate Rinzai Zen at a time when all Zen, whether it was Soto or Rinzai, was, was uh, in rather poor condition. Not much in the way of awakening was happening, and, and Hakuin, being an incredibly stubborn and persistent person, uh, took it to quite far reaches and was able to reinvigorate Zen so that today we can also taste that incredible flavor and practice in the way of Hakuin Zen. Mumon Roshi was the teacher of Harada Shoro Roshi who is also my teacher, uh, second teacher, the first teacher being Roshi Philip Kaplow, and also uh, the teacher of, of uh, Sozui Sensei here at the Hidden Valley Zen Center. And he was known as a, a very, very, very fine master in his day. He was born in 1900, died in 1988, at the age of, of course, 88 and uh, lived uh, an exemplary life of, of teaching. It was when one day the young Harada, who became eventually Harada Shoro Roshi, was uh, on an errand for his father, taking an earlier bus to his high school, and uh, entered the bus at rush hour. It's quite crowded, so he made his way to the back of the bus and was amazed to encounter, seated there, a very quiet, deeply quiet, radiating, no 
elderly gentleman, probably was in his late 50s, early 60s, so I'm not sure I'd call him elderly, but at any rate, he was, he was not a young kid. Uh, and he was dressed in, in priest's robes, and that puzzled the young Harada because he had grown up in the family of a temple priest and wanted nothing to do with Buddhism or the priesthood. And yet there was this very, very amazing seeming human being just quietly engaged in absolute absorption reading a book. And that changed the, the whole trajectory of young Harada's life. And eventually he, he after college, uh, went to Chofukuji, where Momo Roshi was teaching at the time and became a monk under Momo Roshi and eventually his successor 20 years later. Which says something about Rinzai Zen. To do intensive practice in a monastic setting for 20 solid years is in a way a minimum of what it takes to, to create a, a, a teacher in the Rinzai sect. This is intense training. And all along the way, one, one is expected to really embody this practice to the degree that one can. And of course, we're all human beings, and we all have our foibles, and we all have our history, and we all have our blind spots. And the main point is that we continue working. Continue practicing. We continue opening bravely to our well, our stuck places, as Jisun says, the places where we're caught in greed, anger, or delusion. We haven't even realized it. Perhaps other people can see it clearly, but we haven't. And it is the job of the Zen practitioner, especially an advanced Zen practitioner, to to work to embody practice, to work to embody an enlightened mind state. And I know that when I was working with Kapla Roshi, I was, I was over and over and over again impressed by his dedication to that, uh, what's called long maturation by Tore Enji, who is a premier Dharma successor of Hagui. It is where you have had an awakening experience, although it's not necessary to have had awakening experience, to embark on the long maturation, but it's a long, long, long process of maturing into an embodiment of who and what we really are, an expression of our true nature, which means all along the way when we see where we're caught, when we see where we're stuck in, in an ego trip or a a uh, negative habit pattern to, to work intently to let that go so that we can truly embody an awakened mind state. And this is what Kapla Roshi did. All the time I knew him, and I, I was his attendant many years, and uh, twice for extended periods of time in Mexico with him, and I could see that even though he may have had some stuck places, and certainly people were quick to, to point them out to each other, that he had these, uh, as soon as he saw a place where he was stuck, a place where he was caught in greed, anger, or delusion, that was the end of it. It was amazing and humbling to see this. This is the work of a true master, to be able to even, even as a teacher, to see where we are stuck, to see where we are caught in dysfunction, in, in greed, anger, and delusion. And as soon as we can see that, to let it go and move beyond it. This is, this is advanced practice and part of the long maturation. It's something that really everyone in Rinzai Zen in particular, and Zen in general would take to heart and work to embody fully. So Kakuan Shion Zenji is the Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese master who took the Tenok sorting pictures and put them into the format 
that we have in this book. comments on the 10 Oxford pictures. And his uh, student and Dharma successor, Jian Zenji, uh, wrote uh, an introduction. Kakuan Zenji, um, they came already with some, some uh, comments. And Kakuan Xian Zenji added to them. And and she added to that. And then eventually, when these were uh, taken to Japan, somebody in Japan also added a waka poem to them. But today, we're going to take up the introduction that Jion Zenji wrote. And it begins now. All sentient beings possess wisdom themselves from birth, within themselves from birth, the true source by which each develops into a Buddha. That is perhaps the most important sentence in this entire collection. All sentient beings, that means everyone, that means all beings, no matter how deluded they are, how evil their behavior may be, how enlightened they may be, Every single sentient being possesses within themselves from birth. It's nothing they have to buy, nothing they have to earn, nothing they have to try to get. It's a, it's, it comes with being born. The true source by which each develops into a Buddha. This is tremendously hopeful. It means that no matter what you think about yourself, a baby Buddha in there waiting to be awakened, waiting to be activated. No matter how terrible you think you are, no matter what you've done, that potential is still there. Nothing can take it away from you. You have a choice to activate it. It may take some time, and that's an understatement especially if you've had a challenging history. Uh, I think now of the story of Milarepa, the Tibetan sage who had uh, learned black magic at the behest of his mother, who was very bitter about what had happened to them at the hands of some um, rather uh, not so mature relatives. Once her husband, the father of her children, had died, she was very angry because these relatives who were supposed to be taking care of them and sharing the, the husband's wealth with them instead enslaved them, turned them into household servants. And uh, Minarepa's mother was quite bitter about this and she pushed her son to learn black magic so that he could get revenge. And revenge he did get. He did some terrible things with his black magic. He apparently caused a, uh, crop failure that uh, ended up with famine in the area, and his final uh, piece de resistance was that he caused the main pillar holding up the house of the uncle in whom, whose home they had lived, the, um, the uh, evil uncle, and the pillar fell and it crushed everybody in the house as the roof fell. And so he was responsible for a great number of deaths in, <clears throat> in that part of Tibet, as the saying goes. And he, he somehow felt that something was missing in his life, and he sought out spiritual practice and ended up finding a, a, a teacher named Marpa, who was very, very rough on him. It's a relatively famous story in Buddhist circles of Marpa insisting that Milarepa, um, whose actual name was Mila, I believe Repa means something to the effect of sage, a master. Um, but young Mila <coughs> was tasked with building out of rocks because there was nothing else to build out of in that high altitude land of Tibet, uh, houses one after another. 
And the first one he built, and, and uh, at great lengths, was able to complete it, lifting the rocks day after day and producing this house. He was very proud of himself at the end of this and uh, showed it off to Marpa, and Marpa said, you built it in the wrong place. It needs to be over there. Move it over there. And so he did. They built the house in a different location. And then yet another one, and then yet another one, and then yet another one. And then Marpa finally said, uh, sent him to build a tower in a very dangerous part of Tibet. And he went and built the tower, at which point uh, Marpa's wife said, you know, you're being really hard on this kid. Why don't you let up? Uh, he doesn't deserve all this. And Marpa said, well, he's bought it. His karmic retribution for the evil that he's done, causing so many deaths, is going to come back to him. And, and I'm helping him expiate this by this hard work. But if I relent and go easier on him now, he will be responsible for the negative karma that continues to come down to him. Well, eventually, Ilarapa became a great sage and a, a very famous teacher. But even somebody who had history of causing innumerable deaths, very painful deaths, uh, could become enlightened to the point of truly becoming a master. This is what each of us has potential to do, and this is important for each of us to recognize, that no matter what has happened in our life, we can open that little Buddha seed and let it flower this enlightened behavior ourselves. It takes a lot of hard work. We can do it. To continue, through confusion, they get admired in the three realms. Through awakening, they escape at once from the four births. So how come we don't recognize this little Buddha seed within us? It's because things happen to us. People interact with us. Uh, as we grow up and we draw conclusions about ourselves and we develop behavior as a way of either reacting or embodying what we see in other people, or both. And we go farther and farther and farther away from the, the sense that there is this precious something that we have lost contact with that we need to return to. There was a while ago in Christian service, the circles, a story of uh, a family which had two children, a three-year-old and an infant. And the three-year-old begged and begged and begged and begged his parents to let him be alone in the room with his baby brother. And finally they relented because he was so insistent that they wondered what on earth was going on. And they hovered around the door just in case they needed to go in and rescue baby brother from being strangled or something. And they heard this. The little boy ran in, up to the crib, and he said, Quick, tell me what he was like when you were with God. I'm beginning to forget. I'm beginning to forget. We may be able to go back in, in our memory and remember very, very early moments. It's not possible for everybody. Some people can remember farther back than others, and, and we may possibly remember a moment of transcendence, a moment when things were incredibly fine, pure, no problems at all, everything perfect as it was, including ourselves, or not. Maybe we don't remember something like that, but at some level, because we're here in this endo now, we have had some sense that there is something we need to return to, something precious, something vitally important that we need to get back in touch with. And it is true, and it is that, that Buddha seed, that awakened mind state that we can embody. The, 
Through confusion, they get admired in the three realms. Through awakening, they escape at once from the four births. The three realms are the realms of form, formless realm, and the realm of, of well, the, the realm of spirituality, really. We can get caught in any, any realm. We can caught it, get caught in things. We can get caught in ideas. We can get caught even in spirituality. Yet we are, at birth, endowed with a, a freedom from conditioning, from assumptions, from ideas. But as we grow up, as I started to say, we begin to get assumptions about ourselves. We begin to get ideas about ourselves and about others and, and life. And, and uh, not long ago, if you read the news, was a, a, a news item uh, about uh, a Middle Easterner um, who was who egged his two-year-old on to beating up another child of a different religion. That is how we get conditioned. We, we as human beings, naturally seek to embody behavior of those around us. And if it happens to be violent, then there's a very big chance we'll become violent. And even if we don't become violent, uh, whatever the behavior is of those around us, we tend to adopt the outlook. And depending on how we ourselves are treated, we begin to get ideas about who we are, whether we are uh, good people or bad people, whether we are worthy or not, and it colors our interaction with life and with other people, and we get farther and farther and farther away from the truth, which is that we are innately perfect, whole and complete. And so we come to Zen practice, and that can make an enormous difference. Continuing with Jion Osho's commentary, for these reasons, the original sage, who was of course the Buddha, in his compassion, made many paths across a broad field. In doctrine, he put forth the partial and the complete. In teachings, he expounded both the sudden and the gradual. He included both the rough and the fine, encompassed both the shallow and the profound. There are many, many spiritual paths. There are many, many spiritual paths within Buddhism. And there are many, many spiritual paths in other religions as well. And fundamentally, go to the very core of them, they all lead to the same result, which we would call awakening, which in Christianity we call uh, something about God. And there are various different terms for this in various different religions. But the end result is the same. It's rather interesting that the early Christians, who seem to have been very, very much like we Zen folks, Conceived of, conceive of, they, they, since they had to name uh, the experience, they referred to it in the feminine as she, and God was the name for what we would call Buddha nature, enlightenment, true nature, our true essence. There's many, many different words for it. The point is to realize it and then to activate it in your own life. Towards the end of his life, he cast a look with his lotus eyes and drew forth a smile from the ascetic. With this act, the repository of the true Dharma eye was transmitted to all heaven and earth, to all our mundane and every other world. This is in reference to the event uh, supposedly on Vulture Peak in which he held up a flower and no one got it except Mahakashapa, who smiled. And there's been a lot of commentary about what that flower meant and what that smile meant. And that's a good koan for you. What did the Buddha mean when he smiled? What was Mahakashapa responding to? The flower and the smile.
grasp the principle of the Dharma is to transcend sect and overcome doctrine just as a bird in flight leaves no traces. But to grasp at particulars is to quibble over phrasing, to be misled by words and be no better than the fabled tur turtle that swept away its tracks with its tail. And an ideal in Zen is to become trackless, to leave no traces. A bodhisattva leaves no traces. That's a an expression, and that's something we work towards. So that we don't leave anything behind that says, somebody important was here, somebody was here. We go about our life quietly, without any need for applause, without any need for recognition, simply offering ourselves however we can in service service of enlightenment, in the service of compassion, in the service of wisdom. This fabled turtle thought he was hiding his tracks by swishing his tail back and forth over them, and he definitely hided, hid his tracks, but of course he made a new track with his tail, so he was not trackless, he was not leaving no traces, but he thought he was pretty, pretty cool. In recent times, a priest, Sego Zenji, has appeared who takes into consideration the basic condition of his followers, and then, like a doctor, matching treatment to ailment, uses pictures of an ox to adapt his teaching to their individual capacities. This is one of the first people who developed this <coughs> 10 ox ring pictures. At first, he shows stages of not yet realized ability as gradations of whiteness. Then he displays the root potential slowly ripening into the attainment of pure truth. There, at the stage where both person and ox have disappeared from sight, he shows the extinguishing of both mind and things. But here, though the principle underlying the pictures has reached its logical conclusion, his method of expression still leaves a kind of shroud, because that's not the end of the because of this, those whose practice is still shallow of root will have doubts, and those of limited ability will be thrown into confusion. They may even fall into nihilism or plunge into eternalism. Now, when we look at Sokko Zenji, though he models his pictures after those of his talented predecessors, he nevertheless expresses his own mind. His ten verses are so well composed, they illuminate each other with their brilliance. From the first, being lost, to the final, return to the source. His skillful ministering to the abilities of his followers is comparable to feeding the starving and bringing water to the thirsty. In turn, I, Gion, have used these pictures to seek and understand the mystery and meaning of the Dharma, to touch and grasp its profound subtleness, just as the eyeless jellyfish uses the shrimp as its eyes in its search for food, so also I have used these pictures as my eyes. Um, there's a jellyfish that has no eyes, and there are tiny little fish, and in this case, shrimp, that live among its tentacles and seemingly unharmed by the poison in them. And the jellyfish, in essence, uses these critters as its eyes uh, because the, uh, they can see, and when they see something threatening, they will flee, and the jellyfish will follow them. To get out of harm's way, and when they go for food, the jellyfish will will follow and and be able to eat. Yet, from the first searching for the ox to the final re-entry into the marketplace, I have willfully stirred up waves and attached horns sideways onto the ox's head. In other words, to say anything is to add unnecessary stuff something pure. Best we actually do the practice and not think too much about it. But search deeply within ourselves for the answer to the con if we're working on a con for giving ourselves to the yearning to return to our true home extending that out breath and letting that yearning ride on the out breath far, far out beyond our usual way of conceiving of things. Because
because that's where we'll find it. Furthermore, since fundamentally there is no heart mind to be sought after, why then should there be any need to search for an ox? Just who is that devil at the end who enters the marketplace? And what is worse, when an ancestor's tomb is not completed, then misfortune strikes the descendants. This is, a, this is a, an Asian um, saying, that uh, belief that, that uh, if you don't complete the tomb of your ancestors, then misfortune is going to strike the family. And he's using this as a way of saying, if you don't complete this practice, it's not going to be that great. And in a sense, we can relate to that because if we want to stay caught, we've all come to practice because we want to live differently. We want to experience life differently. We have the sense that something's missing in our lives, something not quite uh, square, and that we can find it through this practice. And we can. We truly can. No obvious sense of progress, we yearn for progress, some sign that we're at least on the right path, and it's not forthcoming. But if we persist, if we keep on practicing, even when it's difficult, and I would say even especially when it's difficult, because that's when the most progress can be made, if you want to talk about progress. When it's easy to practice, not anywhere near as much benefit. And the easy times come, I can tell you, from per persevering through the difficult ones. In the end, if you stick it out, if you really stick it out, if you really work hard, if you really stick it out, you will find it infinitely worthwhile. I thank you for listening, and we'll stop now.